Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. It is time to talk about the Wildcats and the Cyclones, K State and Iowa State, getting ready to meet for the first time this season on the basketball floor. They will meet one more time this year, at least, you know, barring the Big 12 tournament. It will be all the way at the end of the regular season. Iowa State will come to Manhattan on that final Saturday. So there's going to be a pretty wide gap between these two teams playing each other right now. But there is a chance that depending on how you value and how you look at these two teams, that they're both playing their best basketball of the season currently. K-State, obviously, we know their struggles early in the year, and they're 4-1 and one in Big 12 play, and their one loss but was by a point on the road at Texas Tech, who they are tied with at the top of the league. Meanwhile, Iowa State, if you look at what they've been able to go out and do, it's a 3-2 and two start in Big 12 play. Their only losses are on the road. And their most recent timeout, Saturday, they went on the road without one of their best players in Taman Lipsy, beat TCU by building a massive lead, taking advantage of turnovers, and turning them into points. So the argument is there that these two teams are playing at their best right now, and we're going to get to see them 8 o'clock Wednesday night in Ames on ESPN2. So, D.Y., what is the uh, number one thought you have going into K-State, Iowa State, Farmageddon on the basketball court? Well, one would be that it's not an ideal matchup for Kansas State, and they also have the difficulty of going into Hilton Coliseum, which is you know similar to Bramlage Coliseum, and that it's a very tough place to win. I mean, it's funny when you hear some of these fans from other schools and other leagues kind of talk down about the Big Twelve in terms of being a truck stop league or or no huge cities. Well, you know, go on the road in this league, and yeah, you may not be playing in. Los Angeles or Las Vegas or Miami, but you're going into these college towns that probably have a lot more pride and passion for their teams uh, because of that. There's a there's a large connection between community and school and community and team and and obviously Jerome Tang can't stay have created that as well and and you know it was that way in Manhattan even before Jerome Tang and it will be afterwards too. But that's just what makes these places tough to play. Ames is one of the toughest places to play in college basketball. You know, if I had to list out, you know, the top 10 environments of, in college basketball uh, across the, the entire country, you know, I bet four or five come from the Big 12. And that's what makes this league hard. Uh, it's not just because the teams in this league assemble their rosters well and recruit well. It's because it's hard to win at opposing environments. Hilton calls Sam as one of those. Now, in terms of being a tough matchup, it's because Kansas State turns it over as about as much as anyone in the country right now. That's their big bugaboo. You could also say it's defensive rebounding. Um, that's probably a little bit more inconsistent. There's been games where they, they've rebounded on the defensive class pretty well. And the fact that they are a poor defensive rebounding team also might be a product of just how hard they play on defense and, and how good they defend. Sometimes that's just a product of how you defend the other team. So less worried about the defensive rebounding, more worried about the turnovers just because that is a significant issue for Kansas State. Kyle was last year, too, so this is a little bit of a trend. And Iowa State, I believe, is number one in forcing turnovers in the entire country. And as you alluded to, that's the reason why they beat TCU in Fort Worth. So that's significant. Um, so you talk about the venue. You talk about, you know, the the matchup. Those things matter. What Another thing that matters, I'm sure we'll touch on at some point, too, and it's probably maybe the third factor. If I wanted to go, you know, we, we pick out two or three factors in every game. I would say, yeah, it's the turnovers. I would say, yeah, it's the venue because of how tough it is to win in Ames. Um, someone might want to touch on a three-point line, but uh, and, that, and that's part of it, but I'll, I'll touch on Tame and Lipsy's health because if he plays and he's close to 100%, this seems like a, a very a big uphill climb for K-State. If Tame and Lipsy is not available, this all of a sudden feels like a game – a road game, which or another road win, which are tough to come by in the Big 12. And the team that wins the league will, that will probably be the one that wins the most road games because just about everybody's going to win at least seven or eight at home, I would think, uh, at least of the contenders for the Big 12 championship. So if you could steal another one on the road, that's significant. And obviously, if Team and Lipsy is not available or is not even remotely close to being 100%, this becomes a little bit of a golden opportunity in another case of maybe right spot, right time for Kansas State. Yeah, I mean, there 
first off, don't discredit uh, K-State. Near the bottom, there are only 338 out of 362 teams in their turnover rate right now in the country. Come on, there's plenty of room between them and uh, whoever's taking up the bottom spot there. But yeah, th- this is an opportunity for K-State. Obviously, if Lipsy and his health isn't even 100% there, I mean, uh, he-, he might go, but you never know in those situations, like how much is a guy actually of the ability to get out there and play. He didn't play on Saturday. He hasn't practiced until Tuesday. Uh, and even with that, TJ Otzelberger said that, you know, th- there wasn't any like contact stuff with it yet. So I'd say that, you know, there's a chance you're getting a banged up version. Even with that, look, I don't think it, I'm not saying it's likely that K-State goes on the road and wins this game at Iowa State because we know Hilton is a tough place to play. But even if Lipsy's out there and he's near his normal level, I'm not going to say that K-State can't get this done because we've seen K-State teams in the past go into Hilton, ones that maybe you know shouldn't win that game or things are kind of stacked against them and they show up and they somehow find a way to get it done. I think they can battle and you know I, you bring up the three-point percentage stuff. It was well documented how bad K-State was shooting the three in non-conference play. I mean, they were really bad. And right now they're still under 32% as a team and, and outside the top 250 in the country in three-point percentage. But in Big 12 play, they're shooting 36% from three, and that puts them inside the top four. The three-point defense has been fantastic. I mean, teams are shooting under 20%, 6% in league play against them, and that's against teams that have shot it well up to this point in the season. Baylor, Oklahoma State, to name a few. Now, they've struggled in Big 12 play. Iowa State is kind of in that same boat. They've been bad in Big 12 play shooting the basketball when they were good throughout most of the the non-conference. Now, competition level changes. You're you're seeing teams ratchet up defense and everything, but they're shooting under 25% in Big 12 play only right now. And K-State could use that to their advantage. And also, I mean, if Lipsy's out, you do lose a gunner right there if you're Iowa State. You're you're basically at that point looking around and leaving it up. I mean, I'm worried like, heck about Milan Mamasilovic. He is the guy that has me like skittish about what K-State can do because too many times we've seen a, a, a big white guy with size just go out there and knock down threes against K-State. Um, yeah, Jazz Koontz did it. I remember I think I was a senior in high school watching Koontz Matt Thomas uh, stroke it against K-State uh, in Bramlage. That was not fun. Like, I'm not a fan of uh, Iowa State shooters because they just rip your heart out. So I think that's something to keep an eye on. And this is a game where K-State, I think the defense is going to be there. I think they're going to get Iowa State to miss some shots. But offensively for K-State, this is a game where you really have to show that the improvement we've seen so far in Big 12 play shooting the basketball is legit. And that's going to take guys like Cam Carter shooting it like he did against Oklahoma State coming through getting Arthur Kaluma more shots, and then Tyler Perry is going to have to come through for you in this game. We really haven't seen him get streaky and make some shots since Texas Tech. Uh, he needs to get on that and help out. And then I think my hope would be for K-State that R.J. Jones, in the minutes he is getting off the bench, can develop into a trusted shooter, and we'll just see how that works out on the road in Ames because I don't know what the bench uh, situation will be like for K-State, how Jerome Tang wants to utilize it. Uh, t- typically is a little bit shorter on the road. So that'll be interesting. Coaches tend to tighten it up a bit more on the road because, you know, one of the one of the things just by nature, I think, in sports is your role players, which is typically your bench. Uh, they don't play as well on the road. You have to rely on your stars more. So maybe a tighter bench. You're right about all those shooting numbers. Um, you could look at it and squint a little bit and say, man, this could play in the, to the favor of Kansas State. Or, you know, glass half empty the law of regression could come back to bite Kansas State. It's like yes. you were this way in the non-con. Now you've been this way through five games. Now we get a little bit of a law of regression, maybe Iowa State's law. You know, The law of averages actually would boost them up, right? Because they they might be due for a good shooting performance. Uh, maybe tougher to do without your true point guard. We'll see what happens with Tame and Lipsy. That's another one too, right? Kind of bizarre. Uh, he Like you called him one of their gunners, and he has been this year. But that's a dude that people were begging to shoot the ball last year. He couldn't hit – a broad side of a bar with the door shut. It's true. I mean, you, you go and look at what he did last year. Like he was 20% from three last season. 
Uh, now, he didn't take many shots from three last year. Because he couldn't so make them. <laughs> this year, he's jumped all the way up to three and a half attempts a game, and he is at 30, 38%. His scoring has doubled. Uh, all this stuff, I mean, he has taken off, and he's been – their best scorer this season, in addition to you know other things that he can do for him, and you look around at, at kind of how Iowa State's going to attack you. I mean, they've got three guys in double figures, but they also have uh, a stretch of guys then behind them. They got four more guys that are at, that put up at least seven a game, and and typically with that, that means you have a deeper you know bench to go to that you have guys that could step up and give you some kind of night. Like we look at K State right now. If you're not getting a big night from any of the the three main guys, Perry, Carter, or Kaluma, you're looking around and just thinking, I don't know that any of these other guys are going to carry the load offensively. Um, Iowa State, they they maximize the opportunity to have a guy go off and have that unstoppable performance that carries you over the top. K-State's just lacking that right now, and, and I don't know that they're ever going to have it this year. That's why you're going to have to just continue to hope you get consistency for sure in games, at least out of the two of the three main guys. But ideally, you want to get to the point where this trio is actually, you know, coming out and, you know, they're all averaging around 15 points a game. Uh, all three of you give that to me on a nightly basis. Don't have these wild swings because consistency to me is the most important thing. If you look at what Keontae Johnson and Marquise Noel gave K-State last year, you knew going into almost every game, okay, these guys are going to give me at least this tonight. I know we can bank on this. And for K-State, that's a real issue because you go into these games and say, I think these guys can do this for us, but there's also a chance they completely bottom out and we just have nothing going. So I, I credit Arthur Kaluma for stepping up in the, the Oklahoma State game because those guys were struggling. We were talking about it up there, I think, late in the first half. They had a combined three points. And then Kaluma scored the last 11. Carter stepped up in the second half. Uh, and, and they made a change. So they can at least break out of it a little bit better uh, if they start poorly. But K-State doesn't have the the amount of opportunities to have a, a big night from one guy as Iowa State does. And that makes them concerning, especially when they're playing at home in front of that crowd. I would agree. Something that's played out, and I, and I think it was kind of front and center during the Oklahoma State game, is Kansas State's not going to win many games or maybe any if just one of those three, one of that trio that they kind of rely on for offensive production the most is is going. Like when it was – I mean, Arthur Kaluma got hot. He scored the first 11 – or the final 11 of the first half. I think him mm -hmm. and Cam Carter scored 13 of the final 14, I want to say, in the game. Like Arthur Kaluma was someone that they were relying on heavily. And that and, and for a while it was just him. There was no Carter. There was no Perry. And, and this kind of goes against what I'm about to say, but there was a point, you know, I think late in the first half before Kaluma caught fire where those three had only combined three points. And at that time they were still up one and then the dam broke because that's only sustainable for so long. Yeah. And then they were trailing for about all of the second half until Perry and Carter got going just enough. All right, Cam knocked down a few threes and, and Perry had a three and I think a th three point play hit some free throws. So uh, I think that what, what that tells us is that it's going to take more than one, but, but if they get two of those three to be clicking on a given night, uh, you probably like their chances. And, and if it's all three, then you're probably not losing regardless of the location of this basketball game and the opponent. Um, not a lot of games where all three of them have been clicking you hope that means they're going to be peaking at the right time, right? Uh, something that Jerome Tang showed he could do last year, and it seems like they're kind of heading in that direction too, where he just – he calls it forging this year. He called it something else last year. But they just kind of ascend just at a perfect rate to where it gets to March, and they're probably one of the last teams you want to play. And it feels like from what we saw from this team in November – some in December, and now what they've been for most of January now, you kind of are feeling better and better about them. So it's it's mm -hmm. interesting how that's unfolding for the second year in a row, and you wonder if that's just a knack and a great skill that Jerome Tang possesses as a coach. Yeah. Uh, dating back to 2006, K-State has only lost – games and aims by more than two possessions so and you know in my book i i count that up to six uh six point deficits they've only lost games like that twice so they have played 
pretty tight games in Ames or they have come out on top. And that's why I just think, I mean, they, they played it tight last year up there. Um, you think, you know, Bruce's last year, they actually won up there. Um, that's why I just think that this team, they, they'll they be able to go up there and fight. It's just going to be, I think like a lot of these Iowa State games have been, if you think about the ones that K-State has ended up losing to them, it's they've kind of killed themselves with a little bit of a lull somewhere or you look at it and, you know, kind of like we, what we talked about, I don't think you can survive playing like you did against Oklahoma State early on where your top three guys only give you three points for the first you know, however many minutes of the game, you can't have a stretch like that. Like at some point, you're going to need those guys to continuously step up. And I I, I don't know if K-State will be able to do that. And that's why I think, um, I mean, we can get into our, our predictions here now. I think that K-State probably goes up there and we see a game play out pretty similar to losses in the past where it's pretty frustrating at the end because they're going to be in it. They're going to be trying to play some catch up. Um, and they probably end up losing this game. I'd throw it in the neighborhood of like 73 to, to 68 or something, and you're going to feel like K-State had an opportunity to win that game, and they didn't end up doing it. Now, if K-State does come out on top in this game, my MVP is going to be Tyler Perry because I just think you know we're kind of getting this stretch where it's been like every couple of games in Big 12 plays popped off. Um I, you're going to need him to step up for you in this game. Uh, we're getting to the stage I was talking about consistency earlier where you feel like Kaluma is going to give you this in a game. You feel like Carter is going to give you this in a game. Hopefully they give it to you with a little less turnovers than what's been going on lately. Tyler Perry is the last piece of those guys that needs to step up. So uh, if K-State is to get the win, I'll, I'll give the nod to Tyler Perry. Yeah, I mean, I agree. This is a gettable game. Um that doesn't mean it's not challenging. It's not tough. It's not difficult. I think every Big 12 road game is at this point. And there's a reason why most teams on the road are losing, even in games that appear winnable, right? I mean, KU's went on the road to UCF and West Virginia. In the final moments, or just those games in general, seem winnable. But, you know, something happens and the home team prevails. That's that's called home court advantage, right? It's good for you know, most of the time, five to ten points. Uh, Jerome Tang talks about it when Bramlage is cooking. Sometimes it's good for 15 or 20. Uh, I don't know if those things are actually true, but sometimes it feels like that because you get you win games you feel like you shouldn't, and when that happens, you're most often the home team. So that's why, while gettable, uh, this game is a challenge. But the reason why it's gettable too, <laughs> and I'll go on a little bit of a tangent here, I think the Big 12 is really good, but – you know, aside from Houston and then maybe Baylor. I mean, here here's the thing. I think the Big 12 is really good because it has a lot of good teams. I'm not convinced there's a lot of great teams in the Big 12 right now. No. I'm really not. And I like Iowa State's not so special that you feel like it's impossible to win in Ames against them. It's it's not. And I felt the same way about Texas Tech and Lubbock. I would feel the same way about Oklahoma. I would feel the same way about BYU. Those teams are good. Yeah. But you don't feel like you have an impossible chance of beating them in their house. Now, when I think of KU, I do because just how good they are at Allen Fieldhouse, right? Yeah. Even though I think that they're more flawed this year than they have been in a while. Um, Baylor, I think maybe because they're so talented, but Baylor's never really had a great home court advantage either in wake up. Now they might just because of that new building and how they built it. Uh, and then with Houston – Again, I don't, I don't know if that's really known for being a raucous and crazy atmosphere. Maybe it will live up to that just because they're playing in Big 12 and having more games that are probably more entertaining and intriguing for the for that fan base. But that one feels maybe impossible just because of the way Houston plays. I mean, Houston, probably top to bottom, the most well-rounded and best team in the Big 12 right now. And hats off to them for being that way because it's their first year in the league. What they will still need to prove is – how good they are on the road if they can survive some of these big 12 road environments because they haven't proven that yet and, and they'll get that chance here pretty soon obviously um so again yes iowa state's not so special that it's impossible to win in Ames. i still will take the cyclones because the odds are is the home team will win right and figure out it'll probably feel like every road loss will this year for the most part that you felt like you had a chance to win but something didn't go right late. You coughed it away. You feel like you gave it away. 
but in reality, it's probably just that you're the road team and they're the home team. So I'll say Iowa State wins. I think it's lower scoring. Uh, I don't know if either of these teams will be scoring at a high clip. I'll say 66, 62, something like that. A uh, free throw, uh, or free throw too late probably makes it a multiple possession game. But I think Kansas State's in it and feel like they have a chance to win. It might feel a little bit like Texas Tech. Hopefully not all, all uh, so similar to Texas <laughs> Tech because that one felt even extra that you probably let it get away. And, and even mm-hmm. Coach Tang admitted that. And, you know, you you said Tyler Perry. That's a good choice. I'll say Cam Carter because it, feel, it feels like a couple games since he's kind of exploded on the offensive end. And I don't know some of that's because of the energy he's expending on the defensive end. He's a really good perimeter defender. And he'll probably have a lot of responsibility in keeping Iowa State, you know, less than hot at the three point line, of course. But I, I think, I think you're, I agree. I feel like you're going to get what you think you're going to get from Kaluma at this point, and you need one of the others to lift up. Uh, but I, I think a, a good Cam Carter game would probably secure a win too, just because. Yeah. And not, nothing against Carter, but if Tyler Perry is not going, and he hasn't been going a lot this year, no, he could still – he's still doing a lot of good things. He's a better defender than he ever has been in his entire career. He's getting a lot of steals. He's getting a lot of rebounds. He's getting a lot of assists. He's facilitating the offense almost entirely by himself because he's been the only point guard uh, for most of the year, or, or at least the most reliable one for the, for almost all of the year, right, and, and never been a one guard. So it, it just feels like – because the ball is in his hands and he's, because he's improved in so many other areas, that Tyler Perry is probably going to be able to give you something this year, even when he's not shooting well. Now, if he's shooting well, Cam State's going to be tough to beat, so I understand him being the player like that. But Cam needs to do something offensively, I think, to have a much larger impact on the game. Uh, he can't get in foul trouble, and he can't turn the ball over seven times. We've seen that in you know the last week or so. So I think he's due for a little bit of a breakout game because he's hit – while he's still figuring out the ways to win as well, he had the, he caught the lob against Oklahoma State. He banked in a three uh, yep. as well, so he's still figuring out ways even amidst the struggles. But he's but he's been in foul trouble. Uh, he had a seven turnover game, so those things are those things won't play well in Ames if Kansas State wants to win. Cam Carter, absent of the turnovers and a little bit of the foul trouble that you talked about against Oklahoma State, he has done in the last really. You know, four games, I'll give him credit for exactly what I want Cam Carter to do for K-State, where the last three he's gone out and he's knocked down a a couple of threes and he's done it in an efficient manner. He was three of seven against O-State, two of five against Baylor, three of five against Tech. And then the one game before that, he was one of six from three, but he got to the line 10 times, made them all, scored 23 for you against West Virginia on just 14 shots. That's the kind of Cam Carter that, you want if you're K-State. But the turnovers are a big deal. We've talked about it a lot, whether it was the Sunday show or any other point. Uh, Iowa State is really good at forcing teams to turn the ball over, and that is such a critical part of this game for K-State. Turnovers are always a big deal. Every game of basketball doesn't matter who's playing. Matters more so because K-State is a high turnover team, and Iowa State is a team that is very good at, at forcing them. And not only forcing them, we saw on Saturday against TCU – took big-time advantage of it, and it was TCU turning the ball over in the first half that let Iowa State hang on to win the game by a point in Fort Worth. So turnovers are a massive deal, and I I, I, I 100% agree with you on Cam Carter uh, being a, a big factor in this game because if he controls the ball and he gives you what he's been giving you for the most part uh, in Big 12 play, you do have a really good chance to win the game. So we'll see how it works out for the Cats Tomorrow night uh, in Ames against Iowa State, 72 to 63 is the Ken Palm prediction. So uh, we'll we'll see. I think I think you and I both might think it's inside of that that number slightly. I it, it could always get up a little high, could sneak away from K State, but I think they play it, another tight one. Just ends with a frustrating loss. Yeah, how how teams do the free throw stuff in a final minute sometimes yeah. plays with that. Uh, I, I'll just say I'd be surprised if it doesn't feel closer than that at least. Yeah, um, yep, I would agree. These these two teams just football. It probably doesn't matter the sport. Just uh, the regional rivalry that this one has become. I think across multiple sports, it would be very surprising. I think for Iowa State to feel like they got a comfortable win here. I, I think they should expect to win, but comfortable. If I was, if I was like, 
if we were Iowa State writers, reporters, media members, I don't think that I would think this one's going to feel like a nine point win even ahead of time. Yeah. Especially since you're coming off a road win. Like maybe if you just got dumped on the road, you come out and have a big splash of a home game. I think that's more likely, but you just stole one on the road. Yeah, exactly. You're you're probably feeling like, okay, when we, you know, we it was fortunate down there in way in Fort Worth. Now we come back and we'll see. I mean, it's similar to how K State uh, and and most of us felt after they lost the heartbreaker in Lubbock was you felt pretty good about their chances against Baylor. And I mean, I didn't think it'd be as close as it was against Oklahoma State, but you did think that they would win I that game. Was, I thought it was because yeah. of the big Baylor win. Sometimes you get a little bit of a because you get you go for the high of beating Baylor top ten, and then you have to like recalibrate and say, okay, this team that hasn't won a Big Twelve game, we have to like you know that's that's tough to recalibrate. I think that was part of why I thought it would be tighter than the experts thought. Um, but yeah, you go back to it like coming off that heartbreaker against Texas Tech, you knew that Kansas State wanted to respond um, and were hungry to get back on the court and kind of to redeem themselves. And that's why people were giving them more of a chance against Baylor than maybe what the rankings or the records would indicate or suggest. Heck, by tip-off, I think the book said K-State is a favorite in that one. Yeah. Uh, last question for you before we get out of here. Outside of the, the big three, Perry, Carter, and Kaluma. Uh, who would you tab as the leading scorer out of the rest of the guys? And, and do you want to put a number on what you think they get to? Yeah, that's it's an interesting <laughs> one. I, it's it's probably just got to be one of the other starters. I don't think you're going to want to pick a bench player for this one, especially since you might tighten up the bench. Dorian Finister coming off a game where he only played seven minutes. Taj Manning, two. They're not playing Buddy Rich. Um, I think Finister's kind of got a little bit of the bug that Tyler Perry had as well. And I think that impacted his play. Obviously not someone known to be an offensive acumen as well. Uh, Dana Ames, it would be maybe a trendy pick here, but you got to worry about a true freshman going against a team that's really turnover um, Yeah, effective. a true freshman that can't shoot. Yeah, although, you know, he made, he at least he made a couple buckets at the rim last week. It's true. Um, so that is at least a step in the right direction. I think some of it's in his head, going through true freshman stuff too, slumping a little bit. Um, but he's never going to be, I don't think, an elite outside shooter either. He wasn't that in high school. So that's something also to keep in mind. But Iowa State, for a true freshman point guard, I think Iowa State's probably the last team you want to see just because they do turn teams over so often. So, And, and man, it's tough because they also limit – really are really good at limiting what teams do in the paint. And the other players are really paint players, right? You got McNair, you got Colbert, um, and, and David Gasson. Uh, you don't, I don't know if I really love any of those. I will just say because of sheer size, because I don't think Iowa State has a really big bruiser, unless I'm forgetting something, then maybe Will McNair is something that they don't see often. Yeah, we'll we'll have to watch. I, I think David Gasson. I we saw him knock down two threes. One of them ended up not counting, but yeah, but he shot not, not always strong with the ball. And uh, Iowa State's you know. just so good in the paint. I don't know. They turn people over. Uh, Maybe and McNair, well, Mc, McNair sometimes isn't either on the glass. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah McNair isn't down, always the know. strongest on the uh, glass. Yeah, I mean, it's not tech. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're probably giving more energy and oxygen here too why Iowa State's kind of a bad matchup for K-State, which is, you know, it scares me a little bit. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it, though, because K-State's got enough flaws that we could find every team in the league and call them a bad matchup. Uh, and Jerome Tank's kind of just been proving us wrong throughout the whole yeah. process. The fact it, that they're it, 4-1 right now. So. Yeah, it, and they can keep Cyclones off the scoreboard. When your defense is that good, you feel like you're going to be in every game. Yep, very true. All right, well, that will do it for us. We will be in Ames on Wednesday night. Full coverage over at kstateonline.com. So head over to On3. You can find us over there. If you're not signed up, do so now so you can get involved with everything we got going and uh, keep following along on the YouTube for more previews and plenty of post-game coverage, including Jerome Tang and the players' thoughts after the game in Ames as the Cats try to get to 5-1 and one and stay atop the Big 12. Uh, a win like this in Ames would give you kind of a step up on other teams because – as we know, Houston already lost there. Uh, KU does not go – or KU does go to Ames this year, but Iowa State doesn't go to Lawrence. So you would, you know, theoretically think that you could maybe add a game on even KU if you were able to win this. 
Yeah, and, and something we haven't mentioned here probably deserves mentioning, and and you know it's tough to, I think our, our bandwidth is sometimes shortening by the day because of everything we gotta keep the pulse on. But the Kansas State ladies again, that's just a a really great win on a, what was a Monday night in Waco. Look, I didn't give them a chance. You know, I Baylor, didn't either. I think that's a better win than their win at home against Texas, who's a better team, and probably better than I, at Iowa, considering the circumstances. Because mm-hmm. this is a, it looked like a get right game for Baylor. They're in their own building. Baylor's really good. They have an All American as well and that's on the court. Kansas State's coming off of a huge winning streak. Just beat their arch rival only two days before. Um, also, just learned that their All American is out for four to six weeks. They're 18 one They're it was like a you know, we say get right game for Baylor. It felt like that, but it felt like a get wrong game for K-State, where they would just get smashed out of the building. They did fall fall down by as many as 13 in that game, I believe, as well. Fought their way back. And I think it was their best win of the season. And it just uh the reason why I brought that up just now, too, it just came across the thing. The coaches pool, which is different than the AP pool, comes out a different day for some reason. The AP poll as Kansas State number four, I think they came out, what, Mm -hmm. Sunday, I want to say, or Monday. The coaches poll, for some reason, I guess comes out on Tuesdays. That's weird. Eh, But Kansas State up to number two in the country. Number two. That feels feels a a lot more online with what you would think K-State's track record this season would say. You have these wins that reflect pretty positively of you. And, uh, you know, the K-State should move up again in the AP as long as they take care of BYU on Saturday at home. So Yeah, and uh, the number two coaches poll ranking that was just released about a half hour ago ties for the highest ranking in school history. So uh, impressive. And they get and, and now you feel like you're in a good spot because you get to come back at home and play BYU on Saturday. Yeah, uh, another note on the K-State women. Uh, and and how things are playing out there for them. Latest bracketology today on ESPN has them up to a two seed in the NCAA tournament field. So, so as long as you stay in that top four seed line, you get to host the first two rounds, uh, which would be a big deal for K-State. They got to do it a couple years back uh, when Stanford couldn't actually host, so Stanford had to come to Manhattan. But uh, it would be a big deal to to stay where they're at right now. And you face a BYU team that has struggled in Big 12 play. They're 2-5. and five. Uh, and their wins are against uh, Cincinnati and Texas Tech. Um, so we'll see. They, they've they struggled uh, on the road this year in Big 12 play. They, they lost by double digits to both Houston and Oklahoma State when they've been on the road and TCU. So, And like KU, that was that be, this BYU team was one that was supposed to be better than what they actually are right yeah. now as well. Uh, yeah, just uh, a good run here for Jeff Minnie and company. Uh, hats off. That that. That is the best win for the women's basketball team probably a while uh, going on the road to be. Now you've beaten, I think you have four top 20 wins against Baylor or or three on the road. Baylor, Iowa, Baylor, North, Iowa. North Carolina is number 20. So, yeah, yep. uh, that's impressive to say the least. Uh, 19 and one also best start in school history. Uh, a lot of things cooking for them. So, uh, yeah, if you're. For some reason, you're going to Houston, then, you know, have fun. But if you're not, uh, Bramlage uh, Saturday when the, the the ladies host BYU to try to go for 20-1. and one. You talk about hosting. That's another point I wanted to make. Not to jinx them, and I hope I'm not doing that. But I would be, considering where they are right now and you, you, you only have a handful of games maybe left without a Yoka, I would be surprised if they don't host at this point. I mean, yeah. they, they'd have to really collapse for that not to be the case. Yep. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but good time for K-State basketball, both men and women. Uh, last week was a perfect week for the two teams combined. They're off to a good start this week, and the K-State men have to do their part on Wednesday night in AIM. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Both. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.